Welcome, Wayne, to this NCRM In Conversation. Uh, this particular series is focusing on artificial intelligence in research or social science research, and we're just extremely happy uh, to have you here today and to welcome you and hear some of your thoughts about AI research and other things. Um, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Sure. Well, firstly, um, you know, thanks. It's really good to be here with you today. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm an associate professor at University College London, and my area of interest is um, is basically is artificial intelligence and education. So teaching and learning with AI and teaching and learning about AI. But I take a critical studies perspective to both those things. Um, alongside that, I also work for organisations such as UNESCO, Council of Europe, Joseph Stefan Institute in Slovenia, International Research Centre for AI, and so on. Um, and it's it's been really interesting lately with the, all these new developments and lots of new experts appearing. So, yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, that does sound like fun. Um, and I think we'll probably get into that a little bit uh, as our conversation unfolds. Um, and my name is Jen Ross, and I am co-director of the Centre for Research in Digital Education at the University of Edinburgh. And you and I have had some opportunities to exchange some thoughts about the discussion that we're about to have. But I think this is going to be uh, interesting for me as well as for those who are hopefully watching and listening later on. So thank you again, Wayne. Thanks for coming. So I want to start by asking you how you came to be doing this work around AI and education. Can you talk a bit about that trajectory? Yeah, sure. So um, I've never left education since the time I was a child through to now. I've always been involved in some way or other. Um, but for a long time, I've been interested in the use of technology in education. And to be honest, at the beginning, I was very much excited by the possibilities. And that's um, what I did my PhD on, for example. Um, but then over the past um, decade or so, um, I kind of slipped into looking at artificial intelligence and education, the various ways in which it is being used. And slowly but surely, I became more um, critical of the ways in which it's being used and the kind of promises that are being made around it. So, yeah. And I've been you know, in and out of uh, academia, working for various organizations since then um, and seeing, you know, how we can move forward. You know, these tools are here. Um, they are having an impact. Um, and I just interested in helping to ensure that the impact is a positive one. Do you still feel optimistic about that possibility? That's really good. Do I feel optimistic? I, I'm I'm on the fence on the optimism, pessimism thing, I think, at the moment. I think there are so many examples of the way in which these tools are not being used well. And <clears throat> the way these tools exist, you know, who owns them, who constructs them, how they're being offered, etc. Are there possibilities, positive possibilities for the future? I'm guessed, you know, there must be some somewhere. And I can think of a few, but the balance is still not there for me. Yeah. And why do you think you became particularly interested in the emergence of AI amongst all the different sort of technological <laughs> educational possibilities? Well, as I said, I, I've always been interested in use of technology in education more broadly. And it just became really clear, um, as I say, about 10 years ago, that AI was developing at a, at a pace and was having more and more of an impact. And so, yeah, when I started to get involved, I was very excited about the possibilities. You know, for example, a learning project I worked on um, was using um, AI tools to give students feedback when they were engaging with an online exploratory learning tool for learning fractions. And I can't tell you when I stood behind a child who was using it. And at a certain point, I thought to myself, if I was teaching this child, I would say something now. And the computer did give a message that was very similar to what I would have said. And that was very exciting. And I thought, this is amazing you know, what these tools possibly can do. But I think over time, I've, it's just become clearer um, you know, where the issues are. Mm. 
so balancing all of that up, where do you see or how do you think AI has had the most impact or effect on education so far? Well, up until, you know, 18, 20 months ago, I'd have said it hasn't had much of an impact. The biggest impact was the emergence of massive multi-million dollar funded companies around the world making massive promises about what these tools can do in education, but an incredible lack of evidence to show that they did do that. So <clears throat> don't get me wrong, the, re the research community, the AI and education research community have done hundreds, if not thousands of studies. And so, yes, we have seen how these things might be used, but the expression I use um, is that we have no independent evidence at scale for the effectiveness, the safety, or the positive impact of these tools in classrooms. And I stand by that. Lots yeah. and lots of little studies, but mostly those studies have been either undertaken by the researchers who have developed a particular tool. So, you know, obviously they have uh, an interest in the tool being shown to be effective, whatever that means. Um, or they've been conducted by companies around the world. Um, and, you know, we need more than that. And um, one of the things that we definitely need more of is most of those studies have been very much focused on the efficacy of the tool. So crudely, and this is not true of all the studies, but crudely, um, the student will be asked to do some kind of test they then use the tool and then the student will do the test a second time. And maybe there's a control group alongside. Um, and that may or may not show that there is some improvement through the use of the tool. But it doesn't show you the wider uh, context. It doesn't show you, you know, what has been the impact on, for example, the mental health of the student while they've been using that tool. What's been the impact on the relationship between the teacher and the student? What's been the impact on the teacher's um, empowerment, their professionalism, the student's agency, and so on and so on. And I think that's you know, where we need to go. Um, we need to understand this far more, far better, um, before these tools become really common. Because at the moment, they're still not common, um, the tools I'm talking about. But of course, you know, over the past 20 months, everything's changed. Yeah. And suddenly we've got um, ChatGPT and the others, the many others. Um, and what's happened with these is whereas most of the tools, education technology have been either brought in by teachers or more often by um, school management or sometimes by um, policymakers, so it's kind of been very top down, with, but with these new tools that have suddenly become available, not new, but available, um, they're, they're from the bottom up. So students are using these tools, teachers are using these tools. Um, and I think that's both fascinating and frightening in almost equal measures. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we'll probably get on to that bottom up nature of generative AI when we come to talk more about research methods in a minute. But um, I think, yeah, that's a really interesting distinction that you're making between the sort of top down um, nature of AI technologies up until recently. And then the way those are sort of being now accompanied by a more bottom up approach that is posing, I suppose, a different set of questions um, for you and your work. Yeah, I mean, it's. It's been dramatic. And, you know, I, I find myself disagreeing with a lot of these new experts mm. and but having quite challenging conversations, you know, because, yeah, because these tools some, can seem so exciting. And I come in as the, I'm not a Luddite, but I'm kind of portrayed as a Luddite, as the, the person who's spoiling the party. <laughs> Interesting. Well, maybe that relates to my next question as well, which is that um, some of the more interesting discussions about AI have been focusing on matters of ethics and social justice. Um, and I suppose uh, bringing those into this conversation that you're having, you know, these conversations you're having broadly uh, probably does throw a spanner into some of the works anyway. 
Um, what's your take or your view on the way ethics and social justice have been uh, addressed in, in your research and uh, in the research that you're familiar with around AI? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, everybody who talks about AI talks about ethics, right? It's always in the conversation somewhere, but it's always a very small part. And it's always, no, it's not always, but it's almost always, um, it's, it's, it's conceived as being about bias, full stop. Yeah. And so, you know, everybody talks about bias and AI and how terrible it is and how we shouldn't allow it to go on. And of course, that's absolutely true. There are huge problems around bias that's moved into um, AI. But it's also used, bias is also used as a way of justifying the use of AI. You know, we should be using, the argument goes, AI in, um, in education, in assessment, because it takes out the bias of the teachers. We should be using AI to decide whether people convicted of crime should or should not go to prison because it takes out the bias of the judges. And I find that hugely worrying because it ignores the fact that the tools themselves are you know, full of biases, both in terms of the data that they um, are built or trained on, but also in terms of the albums that are written and the way they are written, the kind of ways in which um, they target particular outcomes. And as a consequence, they are very biased. But I think the problem is that um, the ethics in AI is much broader than that. Um, and we need to think much more carefully and, you know, ranging from um, who is in control of this technology. You know, we're often told or well, not told specifically, but the impression is given that AI somehow acts and operates out there. It just exists in its own terms and it's in control of what it does. And it couldn't be that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, humans are involved at every step of the process ranging from deciding what they want the AI system to do through to the choice of the data to feed into that system, the writing of the algorithms. Um, in um, a lot of work, the um, identification of the, of the data. Um, so there's the, the stories of the so-called ghost workers in developing countries like Kenya who are tasked with looking at huge amounts of data generated by cameras on autonomous cars, for example, but also were used in the early versions of chat GPT. Um, and these people paid really, really badly and, and see some really quite horrific materials leading to all sorts of human problems there. But that again, you know, is not really part of the story when people are choosing to use these tools. They, that, that's not known or is forgotten or ignored. Um, and I think one of the other problems when, when we talk about the ethics, I say this notion of AI kind of being out there and being independent, but it's not. It's always um, applied in a certain domain. So it's either applied in autonomous cars or it's applied in medicine or it's applied in climate um, research or it's applied in education. And each of those domains have long histories where they've been grappling with the issues of ethics. And so when we bring the ethics of the AI and the ethics of the domain together, that we have that a massive clash. And that's rarely thought about, um, even by some of the leading AI ethics researchers. But I think that's a huge problem. Yeah. And I, I suppose um, equally significant that people working with AI tools and approaches um, as researchers should have a grasp of that breadth of um, of the implications of AI ethics that you're talking about here. Um, this is not just domain specific, but also really touches on um, the way that people can or cannot use artificial intelligence tools as in their research on whatever topic. Um, so I guess building on that, what kinds of new methodological concerns or ideas do you see arising from AI and um, specifically for researchers? Yeah, well, I think I think the first thing we need to think about, make a distinction between AI and research in the natural and earth sciences on the one hand and, and AI and research in the social sciences humanities on the other hand, because it's, I think it's very different. And I think we'll see, I'm trying to get my head around what's different. I think it's that 
uh, the natural and earth sciences kind of one step away from direct impact on humans. It does obviously impact on us, but it's one step away, one step removed. Whereas research in the social sciences um, is not, it's directly on people, it involves people immediately. And I think, you know, on the natural and the earth sciences, um, AI has been used quite broadly for some considerable time on range of things from, you know, climate modeling, optimizing uh, crops in, in, in agriculture, uh, predicting volcanic eruptions, drug discovery, and um, protein folding, a whole range of different things that um, I think, uh, you know, there's lots of benefits that have accrued from that. But I think there are also, there are still massive problems. And the problems are often either ignored, not understood, swept under the carpet. So I've got some examples of that. Um, and this one, I think people don't get, um, you know, during the pandemic. So we're talking, you know, three, four years ago, while it was, you know, in the public uh, eye, um, everyone was saying, well, look, this is the moment when AI is going to um, come to the front. It's going to show its, its, its metal. Um, but actually, um, it didn't. So despite there being a huge number of studies using AI both to try and diagnose COVID or predict where it's going to happen and develop drugs, um, it wasn't particularly successful. It really wasn't. So in my talks, I reference one particular meta study, but there are others. This one was in Nature. And that one found that it identified more than 2,000 published studies. And its phrase were, none were of any clinical use. And I think that kind of disconnect between the public appearance, oh, AI is fantastic to do these amazing things, and the reality, mm. um, I think, was huge. But I think there are other issues as well. And <clears throat> when we're thinking about, you know, the use of AI to predict uh, climate change and ways in which we might ameliorate that, um, which is obviously a critical area, but it forgets the fact that AI is increasingly one of the biggest culprits in damaging the environment. So, you know, I've got three um, examples here, which again, I refer to, which I think are amazing. Um, AI within the next five years is likely to be using as much energy as the entire country of India, right? The most populous country in the world. Um, a typical data center as owned by someone like Microsoft today uses as much water as two and a half thousand Olympic sized swimming pools. Um, and the final one, which I think people don't get at all, is that this fantastic tool that everybody loves to use called ChatGPT, well, the training of that emitted as much CO2 as driving a car to the moon and back. Now, these kind of things really don't um, come to the front. Yeah. And one, one final example I'd like to mention is this thing about um, <clears throat> the tools um, appearing to be so good that what's happening is um, people are becoming over-reliant on them. And so there's lots of evidence from the medical field where they're using AI for um, detecting anomalies in, in X-ray scans and other such things. And what they found was when the, when the um, clinicians first started to use them, and um, they were very skeptical, but then they kind of came around to it and thought that we can use this, but we have to be critical of what we're doing. But now it seems that very often they are over relying upon them and they are themselves becoming deprofessionalized as a consequence. And then, so these, so yes, AI is being used to some amazing effect in the natural earth sciences, but it's not a straightforward thing at all. Yeah, and this feels like um, there's sort of two dimensions to this um, set of warnings that you're putting forward here. One is around whether these tools can actually do what's being promised for them. Um, and the other is whether even if they can, they should because they may not be um, resource efficient enough for us to, in good conscience, um, use them as researchers. Uh, I mean, is that, is that a sort of fair um summary of of those kind of key points there i think it is and i think you know to be fair to the researchers there's a lot of work in how do they make their models and their tools more energy efficient but you know that work is going on but still you know there are stories coming out of places around the world where the local um 
um, server center set up by one of these big companies is using so much water, so much energy that the local town is doesn't have enough energy, doesn't have enough water for people to live. So, you know, there are um, attempts in that direction for sure. And, you know, these tools are not going away. So therefore, we do need to encourage that kind of work. But it's still, I think it's tickling around the edges. It's not dealing with the fundamental problems, I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I guess having highlighted um, those really significant sets of concerns um, or questions that we need to be asking, um, are there any kind of our AI methods that you yourself have found useful or um, are you that you're exploring um, or anything that you think people should definitely stop using immediately? Yeah, well, back in January last year, so just after ChatGPT had been available for a couple of months, I was commissioned to write a report and I thought, well, I, you know, stop moaning about this stuff and actually try it. And so I paid the $20 a month and I used it as best I can. And I, I can write a decent prompt. I don't think that's particularly challenging. Um, within a short time, I was just getting more and more angry and, 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 and not using it at all. I just found it so unhelpful. Yeah. Um, but of course, since then, you know, lots of people are using these tools and particularly in writing. Yeah. And, you know, one of the... I don't know whether it's fun or tragic, but stories that's come out recently is the number of papers that are appearing in which the abstract contains some obviously chat GPT phrases like, you know, I don't have access to real time data in the abstract or yeah. as of my last knowledge update. You know, those kind of things are appearing. But, you know, apparently, if you look at it, that's only really a tiny percentage. But I think where where I'm more worried are the tools that people are using and for me they're, they're misunderstanding how these tools work and they are being fooled by the appearance of amazingness and there's, there's no question right you use these tools they do appear amazing and what the engineers have done to get to that point is amazing I'm not criticizing that at all but what they don't understand is how the tools work and what the impact how the tools work has on how we might choose to use them. Mm -hmm. one, one example there, and this is something I've been kind of thinking through, and it's quite a challenging one to explain, but, but for me to express, not, not for others. Um, when we use something like um, a calculator, we put in a calculation and uh, we get an output and that output is either right or wrong. It's, it's generally speaking, the calculators are now pretty effective. They don't make wrong calculations, but we could press the wrong buttons and therefore get the wrong output. And part of learning how to use a calculator is recognizing when the output is so odd that you need to think about, well, actually, did I press the right button? So it's that critical engagement we need, even with the use of a calculator. And with the early AI tools, you know, pre the large language model like ChatGPT, um, a similar thing was happening. So one of the classic studies is getting an AI system to recognize um, handwritten letters and numbers. And so by using those kind of tools, then that's what's allowed us to, you know, for handwriting recognition, et cetera. But again, with that, we and we can agree you know we're trying to recognize the letter b for bravo and either the ai outputs a b or it doesn't and so we can see that quite quickly it's either right or it's wrong but the radical thing and the difficult thing for me to get my head around is that these large language might they just don't work in that way at all so they don't try to be right or wrong that's not what they're about all they're about is predicting the next word so based on the words we've seen, looking at our training data, what is the most likely next word? That's it. They're, they're, they're really not trying to be correct. And but sometimes, because that training data is so large, it does, the output does somehow seem to correlate with reality. So it appears correct. 
And at other times, it doesn't correlate with the reality, so it appears incorrect. But it's not correct or incorrect, it's just what how it appears. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge problem because people are using these tools and there's a lot of moaning about, well, sometimes they're, they're incorrect. Um, but they, if, if only they understood how the tools work, they would recognize that that in itself is, is a misunderstanding mm -hmm. and that actually they need to think, well, what does this prediction process mean on the kind of things I'm generating? And hopefully to get people to recognize that just because a piece of text or a video or an image, whatever, looks correct, looks real, looks accurate, whatever words we want to use, we must not accept it as being of any of those things. Now, they might be useful, they might be convenient, <clears throat> we might like to use them for our own purposes, that's fine, that's a different thing. But we need to move away from this notion that they're correct or not correct, because it's just, mm. yeah, it's confusing. We're giving it a kind of authority that it really doesn't have, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think um, it brings in all kinds of really important um, questions about accountability, um, about the nature of knowledge, um, and all of these things that as social science researchers, uh, we grapple with anyway, right? But it sort of adds another dimension to them. Like I've been hearing quite a bit, people um, sort of putting forward the idea that perhaps um, large language models like ChatGPT could be very useful for uh, summarizing qualitative, you know, large amounts of qualitative data. Um, and I think the point that you're raising here is that um, however useful or not useful that might seem to be, there is a kind of fundamental question to be answered about what is going on that has produced that either <laughs> useful or not useful seeming output. Uh, absolutely. Um... And I think, you know, with the summarize in particular, I mean, there's there's tools built on top of tools built on top of chat GPT. So it's getting very difficult to understand exactly what's going on. But, you know, there's the the PDF summarizers on the one hand. There's also the, the literature review tools on the other hand. Now, we all know that as academics, you know, summarizing a text is a pain. It's time consuming. But it's a process that we go through. And in going through that process, that's where the learning happens. It's not the thing we end up with at the end. And it's the same with a literature review. You know, fabulous to press a button and look, there's a literature review. But it's not the literature review that I would have done. And it doesn't draw on the kind of things that I would, um, I would think is important as a, as a researcher. So when I first came across this, I was working for UNESCO and there was a, a conference <clears throat> and the idea was to summarize um, what people had said in one of the particular sessions and ChatGPT had just come out like a couple of weeks earlier. So this, this sounds fun, I'll try it. So I took my seven transcripts and I wrote a prompt, you know, according to this uh, issues, summarize this speech. <clears throat> and I was amazed. You know, it was early days. I was amazed by what it output. But in this process, I accidentally put one of the transcripts in twice. And the key is the two outputs were completely different. And I think that's <clears throat> what people have to understand. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I think that's what people have to understand. It's not that when you put a PDF or something into one of these summarizer tools, it gives you the summary. It doesn't, it gives you a summary, one of hundreds of possible summaries. And that might coincide with what you're interested in, but it very likely won't. And very likely will miss some things. So I think, um, yeah, it can be really hazardous and I would not um, suggest anybody uses those kind of tools maybe for a quick thing just to move on but if you're doing anything of any seriousness then then definitely not yeah that's really helpful um and a, a and a kind of um potentially useful kind of way forward and for people in thinking about their own research workflows right it's like where is the moment where this might be something useful um that is okay uh that's that's really great thank you well um i think we should just 
uh, wrap up with one final question. And I think um, you've already touched on so many um, interesting critical questions that we should be asking uh, when adopting AI in research um, and in research methods. Um, is there anything that you really want to kind of emphasize um, or any you know, particular questions you think we should be asking um, when adopting AI in our own work? The key question is, should we be adopting AI in our work? You know, it seems inevitable. It seems it's out there. It seems we should be using it. It seems if we don't use it, we're being very weak. Um, and I think, you know, maybe over time, um, good and effective uses will emerge in the social sciences. But I don't think we're there yet. I really don't. I think the kind of tools that are available now are more hazardous than they are beneficial in terms of the quality of the kind of research that we're trying to engage in. You know, what we do and what social science researchers do, uh, you know, widely and humani humanities research as well, we grapple with some quite challenging issues. What these tools are very good at is superficial responses. So if you're interested in that, then fair enough. But you're, you know, I, I don't believe that most people are. Um, so I think that's important. I think it's important to recognise that it's very easy to be seduced by the apparent quality of what's output by these systems. But we need to be prepared to dig a bit deeper, to take a more critical perspective and to think more carefully about you know how they work and therefore what they are outputting and to think about when um these tools are useful um and i'm always willing to hear <laughs> when they are i don't i can't i can't put my finger on many to many examples where i think they are genuinely useful but you know time will tell i guess um but i think finally the, the last thing that we have to do you know, we typically we work with students and I think we have an obligation to help our students recognize the challenges of these tools, what they do, what they don't do, their potential impact on um, on us as researchers, on human rights, on social justice. You know, one of the classics is that people don't recognize is actually when these tools are being used the companies are extracting data from our usage all the time and they're using that data to improve the tools and therefore to improve their profits and so you know it's been said a long time now that if you're getting something for free in this world then you are the product and i think this has just been accelerated by the use of these tools and so i think it's really important that our students are aware that maybe these tools provide some kind of a shortcut and I completely understand that in some circumstances, a shortcut for some students is essential. I get that. But if the students are genuinely interested in um, personal development, you know, becoming the best they can become as researchers, then they need to think very, very carefully about these tools. But I would say the same to lots of my colleagues as well, <laughs> who seem to get too excited about the possibilities and don't think enough about those challenges. Well, I think this conversation um, and the points that you've raised will certainly be helpful to lots of people as they engage with this series of um, AI in, in conversations. So I just wanna say again, Wayne, thank you so much for making time to do this. It was a really interesting um, discussion and yeah, I look forward to seeing more um, of your work as it, as it uh, continues to challenge and critique um the way that yeah, ai is being presented in education and elsewhere thanks jen Re really enjoyed the conversation and uh, yeah look forward to continuing the conversation it's i think it's quite important stuff <laughs>